evening, folks. Uh, Dr. Engelder and Dr. Engrafia, thank you for being here, Craig and Julie. My name is Craig Stevens. I live in Silver Lake Township, Pennsylvania. I'm an abused landowner. Um, many of you may have read my story. Uh, went in every newspaper in the United States and all over the world. Um, Chesapeake signed my 95-year-old grandmother to a lease. Um, illegally, she was a life tenant. And my question that I'm going to have at the end of a quick statement is a math question, and I'm sure you're both going to be good at it because you're scientists. Um, <clears throat> basically, uh, in order to do this business, you have to take the land from people. Whether they do it willingly or you coerce them, uh, either way, you have to have land first before you can uh, do this business that they're doing here. Uh, in my case, they stole the land from me, and I'm sure that I can find thousands of cases in, here in Pennsylvania where the same thing happened, uh, coerced, lied to. Uh, when they say terms like compulsory integration, they mean eminent domain, and that's stealing. So um, my question to you, and it's a math question, when they signed my grandmother for $50 an acre and 12.5%, uh, which is the minimum you can get in the state of Pennsylvania, thank God they at least put a minimum, or else, or else there'll be people out there who got a half a percent, and I guarantee that. Um, what's the other side of that percentage that they get? Remember, this is my land they're getting it from, my natural resources, they're going to come on my property to do it. When I get 12.5%, What's the percentage they get, and why would they deserve 87.5% of the resources for mine? Uh, I'd like an answer to that from a scientific side, and also where you can find in any scientific journal that it's okay to steal my resources from me or take my land to get it and call it eminent domain. This is not good for anybody, in my opinion, and uh, I'm very sad that this came to the state that I'm a sixth-generation owner of. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, and, and I hope that we can stay in the idea that the questions are asked to both of us so that we both get to respond and then perhaps even have a rebuttal with each other. So Terry suggests that I go first and try to answer your question, and I'll try to be as quick as I can. Um, this is a so-called uh, pro forma that is exhibited to the shareholders of Chesapeake uh, two years ago, uh, decline curve, but more important and to the point of the question is what's up in this green box. So the question was, if a landowner gets 12.5% royalty, what does the gas developer get? So um, on this particular, at that point, average, projected average well for Chesapeake in Pennsylvania, they estimated that it cost them $4.5 million to drill that well. That is to pay the leaseholder the uh, amount of money necessary to get access to the, to the land, to the, create the pad, drill the well, frack it, uh, do everything necessary to start producing gas from it. So remember that number, four and a half million. There's also a finding cost. Somebody had to do the geological explorations. Uh, that's $1.28 per thousand cubic feet. Um, and so now the other number you need to know is, well, what's the gross expected income from this well? And to do that, you need to know two numbers. That's the estimated ultimate recovery, in this case, 4.2 billion cubic feet of gas is estimated to come out of this well in its lifetime. But you also need to know the price of gas. So let's take a nice round number, $5 per thousand. Nobody can project over 50 years what it's going to be, but if you want to start a discussion, at $5 per thousand, that well would produce about $20 million worth of gas, gross. Take off four and a half million, take off $1.28 of that five, so now you're down to uh, somewhere around 12 or 13 million. Uh, if 12.5% is being paid to the leaseholder, uh, one-eighth of 12 million is a million and a half, if I remember correctly, so you're down to 10.5 million net before taxes. Does that answer your question? And that all depends on a lot of things, obviously, whether that's true, whether that's true, what the price of gas is going to be. Or if they pay taxes at all. Oh, you got one. Go ahead. <laughs> There's a probably a button on it. Okay, I got it, got it right now. There are a couple of other things that, that we might amplify on. This is a business that's very expensive on the front end, and so a lot of money is borrowed, and the return, the rate of return, actually is relatively low, largely because the costs of recovering this gas, while cumulative, uh, the 
amount of money put in on the front end for purchase of land, building the infrastructure and whatnot is so large that a lot of the models that are run by industry, I've seen a number of these, indicate that there are as many as eight to ten years that pass before a nickel of profit is actually made off of these things. I can't do the same thing that Tony did because I don't have the slides in front of me. Now, I, I can't address that. Um, Tony, do you know anything about subsidies? Neither of us knows anything about subsidies. What do you have in mind when you say subsidies anyway? What, what are you talking about? You've got to be specific. You can't just say federal subsidies. In what way does Chesapeake visit benefit from federal subsidies? What do you have in mind? That's not a subsidy, I'm sorry. If you're paying taxes, actually you're giving the government money, not them giving you money. Dr. Engelder, then uh, why is there no severance tax in the state of Pennsylvania where there is in all the other states that they do business in? And the other question is, if they paid me $50 an acre, uh, my grandmother $50 an acre, of course I told Chesapeake to give me the current rate, they refused, but I got it, $8,000 an acre now is what they paid my brother and sister and I for our portion. And here's the reason that I asked that question originally. Most of the land they got originally in 06 and 07 was for $25, $50, or $100 an acre. So they got it pretty cheap. Are they going to now pay me the current market value on the back end? They're not going to do it either. That was the question was, why do we are we getting uh, the short change on that one? That was the question. And it's not only in the percentage side of royalty, but it's on the people that signed early to help them get this started are getting the shaft. Yeah, there are a couple questions. First, the severance tax, that's a political decision that, that uh, I'm afraid the people in Harrisburg have to make one way or the other. In fact, the first time that I testified in Harrisburg, which would have been about March of 2008, one of the first slides I put up was a slide that indicated the extent to which the state, through a severance tax, could benefit from the Marcellus. That was more than three years ago now and uh, there still hasn't been a decision on that. Uh, regarding the economics of this relative to when you leased your land, uh, in fact, there are people out there, the people that I really feel um, a, a great deal of sympathy for are those that own land that, that in which the mineral rights have been completely severed. These are people who don't benefit at all and um, I, I can't answer the question concerning, you know, why it is that someone leased early in 2003 or 2004 for $5 an acre and other people waited for a much longer period of time and benefited more. It's a little bit of the luck of the draw as much as anything as far as I can tell. Kevin Millar from Oregon, New York. I've been reading a lot lately about that there's a glut of natural gas in the U.S. and there's been a movement to export it as liquefied natural gas uh, to Europe and other places where the gas is double or triple the price in the U.S. I just wonder how the movement to export liquefied natural gas squares with expecting Americans to sacrifice for American energy security. No, I teach you... Yeah, that's, that's a, that is a good question. I teach a class at Penn State entitled Resource Wars. And one of the things that we do, we just started the semester back at Penn State this past week, and uh, an exercise during the first class is one in which the students are asked, what are the major problems facing America right now? And invariably on the list of the top six or seven, balance of trade appears as a real problem. Right now, of course, we're buying so much, mainly from China, that basically our treasury has been, is, is being drained. And uh, in fact is, the abundance of natural gas offers the opportunity to do something about that, that, that balance of trade. Now, I'm not saying that I recommend it necessarily, but America has a big problem here. We're buying too much, we're consuming too much that was constructed overseas natural resources coming from overseas in the form of oil and whatnot, and America has to rectify that problem somehow. Barry, 
near the podium, maybe, has a cell phone. Okay, well, just while uh, we're finding out the uh, source of uh, the uh, disturbance, uh, the noise, I just want to uh, try and, you know, so, you know just to uh, move things along this way. Everyone gets a chance to ask uh, whatever questions they need to ask. Uh, we're going to try and deal with as many issues as we can. So we're going to try and keep it to around two minutes per uh, question, you know, for question and answer, you know. Little, with maybe a little bit of extra time for uh, our presenters to uh, debate the issue if need be. Thank you. Oh, I thought you were going to answer. No, go right ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Jennifer Hera. I'm from Harrisburg. I'm here with Gas Truth, um, and we have, um, I'm part of that organization that has organized the uh, rally on Inauguration Day. We're welcoming everybody to come and contact us outside if you want to figure out how to get down there. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Engelder for explaining to us um, in great detail. I walked in a little bit late, but I got a good gist of it. Um, it seems that you did a very good job of explaining to us how dangerous this is, and that because of all the variables of the ground underneath, it's, there's no way to tell what is ever going to happen when you put a drill into the ground. So I thought that was very good for you to point us how dangerous this is. Um, I'm a student at Hack, and I'm just getting into studying environmental um, policies and politics and everything. I'm new to this. Um, I've only been studying this for like a year, year and a half. And since I'm from the Harrisburg area, I'm not in the middle of this like all these people are. And I'm concerned for them, but because water flows south, and I live right beside the Susquehanna, what I wonder is if this is let go, unregulated, and say we just let these companies go in there and do whatever they wanted to do, is it possible that I could see places close to me, waterways, streams, even maybe as much as the Susquehanna, tainted and dangerous for my children to swim in? Um, is that possible that if we don't actively participate in our government and try to get them to regulate, regulate this, if not stop it, that we could see the dangers that far south and maybe further? So that's a question that addresses what I refer to as the local issue uh, on a scale of a region. In your case, the region surrounding the Susquehanna River. So uh, I also alluded to the fact that it took Pennsylvania three or four years to enact stricter standards for uh, emission into stream bodies in Pennsylvania of waste fluids from gas development containing inordinately high total dissolved solids. So uh, I, I believe the regulation is now, and Terry, you probably know this better than I do, that 1% uh, uh, dilution, that is only 1% of the total effluent coming out of a public wastewater treatment plant, which might be dumping into the Susquehanna, is allowed initially to be wastewater from, from a well. And that procedure is then monitored to make sure that what goes into that stream body is not any different than it would have been had they not entered the wastewater into that stream. But I have two points to make here. In the last three or four years, that wastewater was entering at very high levels. And as you know, there is some contention that perhaps the issues in Pittsburgh this past summer in the Monongahela were in fact triggered uh, by inordinately high TDS being um, admit, it, it, in, introduced into the Monong Monongahela because it couldn't be treated uh, by the public wastewater treatment plants. Second point I want to make is brine is an interesting word. Uh, brine implies salt water. And the industry uses the word brine to imply that it is salty water. But as geologists know, and even people who aren't geologists who have studied the problem know that the fluids that come back up in particular from the Marcellus, contain things other than potassium chloride, sodium chloride, and other chlorides. They contain heavy metals. And in some cases might also contain naturally occurring radioactive materials. So the levels of those materials, which are potentially harmful to human health, need to be monitored in the same way that materials that were exuded from any other industry operating in an industrial zone inside of a building have to be controlled and yet, right now, as far as I know, certainly in New York State this is true, 
because Pennsylvania is shipping some of its waste fluids for disposal in New York State. By truck, they go through downtown Ithaca every day. Yeah, this stuff from down here goes to my hometown on its way to two wastewater treatment plants in upstate New York, which are being paid handsomely to take it. That waste fluid is treated as if it is only salt water. So whatever else is in there is in there, and it's going into the streams of New York. And I don't think that's right. That is a potential cumulative environmental impact that we have not yet begun to measure. So those are my two responses. In summary, things have improved in Pennsylvania, but there are still other things that need to be tightened up. Yeah, I think where we're going in Pennsylvania, Tony mentioned right now that there are only two of 78 companies, companies that, that completely recycle water. I think that very, on very short order, you're going to see a lot larger number of the companies completely recycling the water so that, that, that waste treatment will become less and less of an issue. We have to come a long way before that, that, that happens, however. Good evening. My name is Deb Weir, and I am one of the co-founders of Walk About Water. There are some flyers out front. On April 17th, we'll be doing a 100-mile walk from New York to Pennsylvania carrying clean water. And uh, we welcome everyone to join us. My question is for both of the doctors this evening, and I thank you for, obviously, a lot of preparation that went into this and some excellent presentations. Um, both of you, and especially Dr. Engelder, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, cited this as a difference in belief systems. I believe that's how you put it, Dr. Engelder. And uh, that both of your beliefs are based in science, but that you differ in beliefs. Um, your belief, Dr. Engelder, if I understood it correctly, is that uh, the industry can and will um, become more responsible and more effective. And uh, Dr. Engrafias is the opposite. I'd like to know what each of you base those beliefs on, because in your speech, Dr. Engelder, you cited two instances of exceptionally poor responsibility or accountability on the part of the industry, one being dumping uh, of surface materials at the Meeks well, and the other one being the denial of responsibility by Cabot, which I believe you cited as uh, inevitable and for their own protection. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> Regarding this belief system, uh, we're not developing a belief, either uh, Tony or, or myself, based on scientific fact. What we are doing is differing over engineering outcomes. Basically, the human response, or if you like, industrial response to a particular need. And um, again, a belief is something that, that one can, we, we can't even talk to one another about it because our perception of this is very different. What we hope, and I think this is, this is fair, we hope that, that by the two of us appearing together, uh, industry is goaded into action. And uh, if industry is, is not able to, so to speak, clean its act up, uh, then the penalty they pay, I suspect, is a much stronger set of regulations at the federal level. And of course, we've debated a great deal whether or not the state regulatory agencies are capable of handling the job. I would hope so, but that has yet to play out. So there are questions within questions from that question, one having to do with, with belief systems. I agree with Terry that b belief systems have no place to play in the evaluation of what's going on here. This is not a religion to me. Uh, it shouldn't be a religion to you. Um, I think one of the things, I'm philosophizing here for a minute, so bear with me. One of the things that's happened in the last generation in the US is the politicization of so-called science. If you can turn science questions into political issues, everybody has beliefs on political issues, and you're, you're allowed to say, that's my belief, take it or leave it. But that's not the way science works. Science is based on understanding natural law and making use of that through engineering and technology, and that has nothing to do with beliefs. Um, so it's not a matter of belief here that I don't think that when the dust clears and the industry claims that it can and will get things right 
technically and regulatorily that they're still doing the right thing. From a science point of view, and this is where the science becomes most important at the global scale, I think that going down the road of burning much more, listen clear carefully, burning much more gas, most of it coming from unconventional sources like the Marcellus, underline without a concomitant decrease in burning of fossil fuels from other sources is taking us where nobody in this room wants to go. And that's global, increased global climate change at an increasing rate. So, and, and that's why I kept emphasizing the difference between an industrial business plan and a national energy strategy. If the national energy strategy, which we don't have, okay, said that yes, we're gonna ramp up natural gas production for all the reasons that Terry said are good, but we're going to ramp down the burning of coal and ramp down the burning of petroleum while at the same time we allow the emergence of what we all need for our grandchildren, which is renewables and green energy. We're all gonna die before that happens and it won't make a bit of difference to us, but it's gonna make a bit of a difference to our kids and a hell of a difference for our grandchildren. So until I see the industry doing something for their country and saying, we're gonna back off for a while and we're gonna wait for that strategy to emerge. And then we're gonna do what their TV commercials say they're doing, which is investing heavily in green energy. A few million dollars here, a few million dollars there, less than they're gonna make from one well in one of your backyards. So until I see that commitment from the industry to work with the people of the United States and with the Congress to develop a coherent plan, which means in the short term, they might not make as much money for their shareholders, but they're making a sacrifice for us. Let me uh, further comment that in terms of burning hydrocarbons, burning coal and the companies and industry that control burning coal and burning natural gas, these are two different constituencies that, that don't overlap in a Venn diagram. And you both can of them say are that again. <laughs> competing against one another. And uh, here is where I think, I think Tony's vision is absolutely correct. And uh, the people in the natural gas industry have pointed out that if you, replace natural, if you replace coal with natural gas, then you end up with a better result concerning global warming. But the question really remains, who is it in the coal industry that's going to seize the opportunity and stop burning coal? And I think we all know that, that the coal industry is not going to immediately raise its hands and say, well, we better sit down so we can clean our act up here in the United States. That's where the regulators come. That's where this national policy comes from that, that Tony has just mentioned. This is going to take political will to, to do this, ramping up one while ramping down two others. And I, it's, it's not going to be voluntary. OK, can we have our next uh, question here? Hi, my name is Gregory Pace. And I'm a naturopathic physician practicing in Williamsport. But I want to speak and offer a comment uh, to the first part of uh, Dr. Engelzer's presentation regarding energy use in this country and GDP and how that's going up and up. And so because we'd like to use energy, we have to have more, you know, we, we like a higher GDP, we have to have more energy. And uh, I go back to my experience in the 70s and 80s in California where I was working in the field of energy conservation and alternative energy. And the whole part of the equation that missed out of uh, that we heard this evening was us conserving energy so that we can still have a, a good lifestyle, maybe not exactly what we have now. The GDP might drop, but GDP doesn't really relate directly to what you and I experience as a good, healthy lifestyle. So conservation was totally left out of that equation of all those graphs and numbers that was offered up about energy use, and that was my, that's my comment. Thank you. I should point out in this graph, you saw GDP separating very dramatically from energy use. And the primary driver of that is actually conservation. Patience.
participation? Okay, so uh, Terry showed a couple of graphs um, earlier that you're going to see repeats of at, at different scales. And so I want to make the point here about energy. You, you asked about energy conservation, and there's also the issue of energy efficiency. So um, again, graphs. Terry already told you what a quad is, and this is years. And as you can see, the consumption of energy in the U.S. Uh, over the last 40 years or 50 years has continued to increase, but it's increased at a decreasing rate. Those of you who know about calculus know all about rates, right? Everybody here is taking calculus. Okay, so let me explain by a rate. A rate is a slope. So I could do that with that black curve up until about 1970, and notice the slope of that curve decreased from 1970 to 2000, and over the last decade, it's fairly flat. So I bet everybody in this room came in here tonight thinking that the United States is in an energy crisis because the rate at which we're consuming energy is drastically increasing. Well, that's not the crisis. The crisis is when you look at the green curve. This is the amount of energy produced in the United States. And as you can see, over the last 30 years, the gap is growing. So I have two questions. I got asked a question. Terry, you like to ask questions of the classroom, right? It's a good pedagogical tool. Why do you suppose that even though the population of the United States keeps growing and everybody is using more and more, well, we're not using more and more personal energy, are we? Because if the population is going up, but the rate of increase of energy has gone flat, that means efficiency and conservation. Okay? So we've seen those kick in. The question now for us, which goes back to this cumulative environmental impact on the largest scale, is how do we continue to provide, as Terry said, the standard of living we're used to in the U.S., which is manifest by this amount of consumption, while eliminating that gap? Oops, I'm going to go backwards here. Oop, don't want to let the cat out of the bag. So let's project forwards. Let's talk about our grandkids. Let's talk about the grandkids that were born this year who are going to be more or less your age in 40 years. They got it. <laughs> okay, so let's project out to 2040, and let's imagine that we can continue to actually decrease the total amount of energy we're using in this country by better conservation and better efficiencies. Instead of consuming 100 quads, let's be conservative and say 90 quads. I think we can do better than that, but 90 quads. Now all we got to do is figure out how to get the uh, roughly 70 quads we're producing to be up there while at the same time decreasing fossil fuel burning in the United States. Uh-oh. That's burning our candle from both ends, pardon the pun. So here you go. You're all citizens, you get to vote. You're all citizens, you get to write letters to the editor. So let's go ahead and imagine that we can get to that 90 quads. How do we get from here to here on our own? Well, wait a minute. Here, here's, here's, this is a graph that Terry showed earlier tonight. This is all of the energy sources being consumed in the U.S. right now. Petroleum, natural gas, coal, nuclear electric power, hydroelectric power, biomass. Notice that the total amount of energy produced in the U.S. right now by the so-called green alternatives, wind and solar, don't even show up yet. Okay. Oh, yeah, but wait a minute. So here you now get to solve the problem. Right? But remember, you have constraints that we've already mentioned. The political constraint of coal doesn't want to go away. They want gas to go away. Your constraint that you keep wanting to drive a car that uses gasoline instead of natural gas or electricity. I'm not going to ask how many SUVs are in the parking lot. Okay? Under the constraint that um, we have to invent some of the technologies so we can scale them up. And we have to tell a lot of companies to go out of business. And that's going to cause a fairly large shift in employment in the U.S. from what they're currently doing to what they might be doing. So here is one of a million possibilities. Actually, there's an infinite number of possibilities to solve that problem. But as engineers say, as Terry and I know, the solution space that's feasible is very small. But the, solution, the actual solution space is infinitely large. In other words, an infinite number of solutions to this problem, very few of which can work. Here you go. Let's ramp up wind, solar, and other renewables from virtually zero to one-third of energy consumption in the U.S. over 30 years. Doable? Yes. 
uh-oh, let's ramp up nuclear from where it is to 20 quads. Let's drop petroleum, natural gas, and coal. Well, I haven't gotten to coal yet. Let's drop petroleum and natural gas down to here and increase biomass, All right? Uh, let's drop coal down to virtually nothing and keep hydroelectric more or less the same. That adds up to 90 quads. That's one of an infinite number of possibilities. It can only happen if the politicians, if you, the global marketplace, technological innovation from bright young American graduate students who invent these things can come into play. But I, I'm sorry to be a visionary tonight, but if you don't have something like that in mind, what the hell are we doing? Is it just a corporate business plan or is it a strategic energy policy? That's my point. Tony, on this calculation where you show wind energy going up as high as it does, how many windmills does that mean they're going to build in Sullivan County? A lot of them. A lot of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how much space is going to have to be opened up? How many trees are going to have to come down? How many wires are going to have to be run here and there? And it, the, the answer is a lot of them. Uh, so I guess the point, we're, we're, we're back to this necessary sacrifice business. <laughs> It, it's just a matter of how you're going to make the sacrifice, and, and I'm not here to tell you one way or the other, but it will be a sacrifice. My name's John Kessich. I'm from Tioga County, and I'm a member of Citizens Concerned about uh, natural gas drilling. And the first thing I'd like to do is to present each of the panelists with a bumper sticker. It reads, fracking pollutes, no dirty drilling. OK. Um, I would like to start with an observation. The uh, investment money for windmills has dried up largely due to the boom in natural gas. So how exactly is natural gas a bridge fuel to renewable energy if it cuts out the investment from under it. The other thing I would like to point out is that if Ronald Reagan back in the 80s had not said, drill here, drill now, I don't think we'd be standing here having this discussion. I think we'd be living in a renewable energy world. Um, finally, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, experimentation. As both of you are, I'm sure, quite well aware, DEP, in conjunction with the Pennsylvania State Troopers, conducted three fracnet inspection blitzes of gas trucks. I forget the exact percentage but the number of drivers and trucks which were removed from service was abysmal in all three of them. How much more experimentation does it take for the gas industry to figure out the right way to do truck safety? Thank you. Let me answer the, this, the, the questions backwards by pointing out that, that one of the things that the gas industry really owes us is a bit of leadership in truck handling. Uh, and, and for example, it could start by the conversion of trucks from diesel fuel to driving natural gas. Now, what this means is a collaboration then between the operators and that kind of capital and General Motors and International Harvester, whoever makes the big trucks, because I don't think this is a very difficult conversion to do. The trucks that are being constructed now, the tank trucks, the trucks that pull around the equipment, they're going to be in the Appalachian Basin for a long time, and there's no reason why they have to go to a diesel gas station to refuel. Just plain refuel at any one of a, a, how many wells will be around, how many pads will be around. My golly, there will be a gas station, natural gas station, about once every mile. And uh, in this regard, industry really owes us 
uh, um, a, a, a leadership role in stepping forward and doing this. There's no excuse for driving around diesel-powered trucks in the Appalachian Basin. That was the first question. The question about why is it that, that windmill um, capital has, has been drying up, and I, is that something, Tony, that you would care to take a crack at? Uh, I'll take I, a shot. Re remember that I'm not an economist. I'm certainly not uh, a macroeconomist, but I've, I've read government reports, and uh, the, the very simple issue is the price of natural gas has plummeted uh, from its 2008 high of roughly $12 per thousand to where it's been for the last year or so down between 350 and 450 a thousand. And that has made uh, the price of natural gas attractive for um, electric power generation and increased industrial use. Uh, and it makes the currently non-scaled up economy of scale benefiting uh, alternatives less palatable. I'll say that another way. If a, if a company or a bank has money to invest uh, and they can invest it in, in solar, knowing that their return is going to be very low, and it might not be for another decade or so until economies of scale continue to kick in, or they can invest in buying something that uses natural gas at $4 a thousand, the answer is quite obvious. So at this point, um, it's not good for development of sustainable energy in the U.S. to have a low price of natural gas. It's not good for the landowners who have leased and are expecting big royalties to have a low price for natural gas. It's not good for the shareholders of gas companies to have a low price of natural gas. They brought it on themselves. What about the, uh, the consumer is not benefiting from the low price of natural gas. I don't know if you noticed your gas bills recently. I don't know about you, but in New York, they're regulated. I guess they are nationally. Our gas prices are going up, even though the price of natural gas has gone off by a factor of three in the last two years. Uh, OK, um, once again, I have to remind, uh, remind everyone here, we have to move things along, kind of keep it as brief as you can. We only have a few minutes left, and I would like to see everyone's answers. Uh, sorry, everyone's questions addressed. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ngrafi and Dr. Endegor. Um, I, would have, I would have liked to heard the end of your presentation, the uh, containment of water. It was interesting to hear what, what you uh, might have said on that. I haven't seen uh, the whole water thing, what they, what they term as fresh water, I've just found out it means that they can actually just remove four elements after putting several hundred chemicals possibly into it and calling it fresh water. Um, Terry, if you don't mind me calling that, um, you seem like such an important point man in this industry. And one of the things that I see as the end of the road of what all these things are is to health. Is there any way of collecting if someone that such a point in it person in this that with all this data that you would also look at the human element behind this. Can you have someone like Penn State collect the data for how many contaminated wells there are in Pennsylvania? People who might be getting sick from these things, the types of sicknesses. I realize that you're not a toxicologist and so forth, but i just, my son's an engineer, he's going to be graduating from Penn State this year. I'm a little bit miffed at the point that everything that seems to be coming out of Penn State is pro-gas. I think there needs to be a balance. Yeah. Can I respond? Sure. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, you're well aware, or at least the first slide I put up, uh, recognize the Penn State Center for uh, Outreach and research, and we're looking at a number of different issues, not necessarily all of them uh, pro-gas. The collection of data, for example, on uh, water throughout the state is something that, that uh, we're looking at. The question, of course, here is what is the base level chemistry of water across the state? Um, there are still a number of questions I agree. For example, on the way up, my wife and I, whom I haven't seen back there in the audience, I, I assume that 
my wife is around still. Oh, there you are. Okay. My wife and I were asking the question. We watched Fox's film, and one of the women in the um, pavilion area was complaining about headaches that she was getting, and I asked my wife, what happens when you breathe methane, low levels of methane over a long period of time? Is this possible manifestation of that? I asked Tony, do you, have you heard of any studies of that particular question? I haven't. And uh, um, I've had patients that have had exposure to methane headaches. So yeah, I, but. Yeah, and, and it's, it, uh, it stands the reason that there has to be some effect. Uh, methane in a large enough quantity, of course, would kill you, just like carbon monoxide. And I, it's, it surprises me. You're a doctor, I gather. And have you seen anything like this in the literature any place? Yeah, it, and, and so there's a, there's, there is a, a real need here, and again, um, uh, this is another challenge for industry. They really need to pick up the gauntlet on this and uh, fund this type of question. Uh, Tony? Very, very brief on headaches. So um, last fall, a number of colleagues from uh, Ithaca and I were invited to visit one of the new fledgling, what I refer to as fledgling, recycling facilities in Pennsylvania. This is a great example of what Terry called the ingenuity, the ingenious spirit of the American engineer. Let's find a way to solve this recycling problem. So uh, a company from Canada proof tested the technology in Texas, moved up to Williamsport, and decided to develop a recycling facility in Pennsylvania. What's that got to do with headaches? Well, here's Wegmans. Here's the recycling facility. That's stupid. <laughs> now, this is another example of not planning ahead. Now, the people that, that are running that recycling facility know it's in the wrong place. It's in downtown Williamsport, two football throws away from the Wegmans. And the waste trucks pull in right here. I stood there and watched them. This is an open bay. They dump 6,000 gallons of frac fluid in an open bay, and nobody was wearing a respirator, including the eight of us. And nearly instantaneously, we were sick. The point I'm making is that I'm kicking a dead horse here, right? Plan ahead. Don't put a waste facility in downtown Williamsport next to a Wegmans. Okay. I, I just want to sum things up quickly. I mean, you make some reference to Julie and them. I live in another ground zero, and there's other ones developing in Pennsylvania. Not to slight anything from what the Dimmick people have to, and I hope I never have the neighbors have to deal with what they are dealing with. But 1,500 feet to my east, to my north, the river is bubbling methane a mile and a half to my northeast. If Penn State could use their ability as a database to collect data and to be able to help maybe you understand what the human factor is behind your push for this, we might come out of it with even better things than just toilet paper. Right, thank you. Once again, we only have a few minutes, so let's keep it brief, folks. Again, thank you for coming. My name is Carrie Stern, and I'm from Montoursville, and I have a question for both Dr. Engeller and Dr. Engrafia. Governor Corbett gives you a phone call and appoints you the czars of the Marcellus Shale program in Pennsylvania. I would like to know your strategic energy plan for our state. Several points from both of you, please. I didn't know Pennsylvania had an energy czar. The question is sort of a, a, a ten-pronged animal right here. Uh, which way do we go? Well, uh, first of all, the state needs to benefit from the wealth of natural gas. I, I, again, I mentioned I made this very clear in my first presentation in front of the legislators in March or April of 2008. Um, the tax, of course, has to be reasonable, and it has to be in the context of whatever the 
corporate income taxes in, in, in Pennsylvania as well. And, and again, we have a bit of a problem because some of the companies are taxed in Pennsylvania, others are taxed in other states. And so I don't know exactly what the solution is in terms of a fair and equitable way of raising um, a fair income from the Marcellus. Uh, in terms of production, maybe the next question might be what, it, what to do about the state forest lands that have not been leased. And um, I think that, that I agree with uh, some proposals that have been made that there should be no rush to lease those. In fact, is right now the companies are having trouble enough drilling to hold their leases that they have. And uh, believe you me, this resource is large enough so that there's no rush, no reason to rush in leasing of, of more land. In fact, is there's not the, I don't believe there's the capital out there to actually take care of this additional tranche. In what that does, I would advise the governor, is it gives us time to really decide how to maximize the benefit to the state of Pennsylvania from Pennsylvania lands. These are public lands, and uh, the best outcome is one that, that benefits the public. And, and here again, we have to use, I think I would tell the governor that, that we need the New York State model on that land, which is that you really think about it, and you think about it if it takes the entire term of the present governor to figure this out, figure it out, take the time to do that. Uh, that would be that would be point number two. Point number three, again, the staffing in the DEP is probably even now, despite the increase in the staff, probably not sufficient to rise to the occasion. Now, Tony has mentioned that the number of incidences has increased faster than the number of pads or something like that. Well, there are a number of, number of reasons that I can think of why that should be. One of which is there are more inspectors around, so they're just, the more people are looking, the more citations can be issued. Um, I think right now, the DEP staff is rather young and inexperienced. They'll get better as, as time goes on, but uh, um, the development of an adequate training technique or a training facility or a training strategy for these people to interact with industry is, is I think, one of the things that I'd really have the governor work on uh, very, very early. I mean, that, that would be the second days in office. He would say, let's, let's really take another look at how DEP does its job and let's put the resources in play. Now, I've gone longer than two minutes, so I'm going to stop at three points. I could go on if you want to talk to me privately afterwards. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have time for, we're, I'm only going to be able to allow one more question. We, what's that? Can Tony rebut that? Yes, yeah, it, well, yes, I will. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ingraffi, if you'd like to rebut that. Um, I, I, I was going to pass so we get more people in, but I'll make a real quick one. So the New York State does have something called NYSERDA, New York State Energy Resource Development Administration, where there is a so-called czar who is supposed to be helping New York State see the big picture. And so my first reaction would be, if I were in Pennsylvania, I'd say make sure that Pennsylvania's state strategy is consistent with a national strategy, which we don't have. Uh, and then I would... Uh, make sure that, new, that Pennsylvanians are using all of their homebred technology. For example, Penn State has the best people in the state who know about rock. How about geothermal for Pennsylvania? All that expertise, yeah. all that wonderful expertise, instead of going into a non-renewable and potentially health harmful resource like shale, develop geothermal in Pennsylvania as part of the, national, as part of the state energy picture. Enough. Okay, uh, we have time for, I'm sorry folks, one more question. That's uh, Tom, don't look at me that way. <laughs> don't give me those puppy dog eyes, Tom. Uh, uh, we, really, we, we only have time for one. We, we were only supposed to be here until 10 p.m., so I, I do apologize. So one more question, and that'll be it. Thank you. 
Okay, this question's on uh, the Chesapeake Bay watershed implementation plans. Uh, of all the development, the roadways, pipelines, well pads, and uh, the truck traffic, and other uh, fossil fuels that have to be used for the development of each well pad, uh, how does the deposition of the airborne uh, emissions and the sediments affect the Chesapeake Bay and that plan and the different consequences that the EPA has already spelled out. Yeah, I, wrong guys to ask. Yeah, I, neither of us, neither of us are capable yeah. really of giving that a sensible answer. Uh, one, one brief comment that the plan that was recently released by the EPA was developed before the EPA had intimate knowledge of what's going on with shale gas. So it's, again, it's, it needs to be reworked. It's not just on, the owner should not just be on the farmers, it should be on everybody who's developing gas too. Okay, I, I think that's fair enough, and that's how we will close out this evening. Why rush, gentlemen? Why rush to the gas? Yeah. All right, I, I, I will go first because I was largely responsible for the rush. And uh, I, it, you, you saw my tombstone up there, incidentally, you guys, so that's still up in the, hanging in the balance. And uh, it, at any rate, the effect of what I did was to commit industry to spending somewhere between 200 million and a billion dollars on land acquisition. Land acquisition is not permanent. Often leases are five-year leases, and the rush really is not to obtain natural gas necessarily. We all saw what happened when we rushed to obtain natural gas. The price went through the basement. That didn't help industry, but industry is running against the very severe constraints of a clock ticking away very rapidly, if they don't drill the hold, they lose that billion dollars. And I can't apologize for it. This is the way the system works. And uh, uh, no one is going to walk away from that, that billion dollars. That, that's, that's probably the reason for the rush, if you ask why the rush. now. Um, there are a lot of reasons why that shouldn't happen, but it, the, uh, the rush is a consequence of the economics of the, of the play, that billion dollars up front. Uh, I think Terry nailed the reason for the rush, um, but my reaction to that reason is the following. We live in a capitalist society, and part of capitalism is risk. And the industry took a risk by investing too early, too big, and I'm sorry, there's no good reason why we should effectively subsidize that risk and guarantee that the companies still make money. I'm sorry. You... Yeah. That's how capitalism is supposed to work. You're not guaranteed a profit. So those are my last words. OK, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, our presenters here tonight, Dr. Engelberg. Dr. Rafia, Craig and Julie Schaffner, and Kinnick, all of whom have come here, you know, on their own, on their own money. They weren't paid to be here. And I'd like to thank all of you who came from various places. I know some quite far. Also, Responsible Drilling Alliance and uh, Protect Eagles Mirror Alliance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Yes. Uh, Good job. Good job. Oh, okay. Look forward to saying hi to you. Did a great job.